Hi, hi, my name's Jonathan Sharples, and I've been talking about how we take information from research and make it available and useful for, for practitioners, and hopefully outline some ways in which they can use evidence in their day-to-day -day practice. My name's uh, Jonathan Sharples, and I'm based at a group called the Institute for Effective Education um, um, up at York University. Although I've just started this week um, working at the Education Endowment Foundation, uh, working with Kevin Collins and, and people there, um, trying to mobilise some of this great knowledge that they're creating down there. So I'm, I'm sure you may have heard of the Pupil Premium Toolkit and things like that. So how to get this information that they're, that they're creating out, out to the people that need it, um, essentially teachers. It's, it really is quite amazing to see so many people here today. We, I've been involved in this area for around about six or seven, seven years and seen it move from what feels like a relatively small scale kind of interest, often with a lot of academic input, to, to something that's really, really got momentum at the moment and, and real um, interest outside of academia. And I think that's really exciting because that's where the momentum should be and this needs to be in the hands of professionals. Um, so. Um, it, it really is great to, to see so many people here. Um, just very briefly about what we do up in York, I guess in a nutshell we try and capture and spread what works or what has worked um, in teaching and learning. And the capturing bit is the research um, and by that we develop programmes, we try and develop um, new approaches to teaching, we do evaluations both of our own approaches, but we also do external evaluations. So we do a number of evaluations for the Education Endowment Foundation, for example. Um, we do reviews, um, and the idea of a review is that it pulls together information from lots of different studies and tries to find the themes and trends that, that emerge from when you look collectively at lots of studies. And that, but that's the, that's the capturing bit. Where we're perhaps different from some traditional university departments is that there's a team of us there that are not interested in actually doing research but trying to spread that, try and get that information out to the sector um, and try and get, get it in a way that people can access and, and make um, use of. It's quite interesting, when we started around about five years ago, that, that says influence policy. But I think at the time that was felt as though what this was all about, we had to work through the, through the DfE, we had to get things through policy. And it's interesting that you know, we, do, we still do a lot of work with policy, but it's more around lobbying, really, for, to create this infrastructure to support research use. The actual work we do more now is more, much more directly with schools, supporting schools to find evidence, to use it, support them to do evaluations. So I think it's interesting, it shows that slight shift in landscape that I think, um, certainly if you look at the nature of our work, it's moved much more directly to working with, with schools and networks of schools. Um, earlier this year, I was... Um, it's a real shameless plug, this is. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was asked to write a, a report for what's called the Alliance for Useful Evidence. Um, and they asked me to write this um, overview of really the stuff that we've learned over the last five, six years about what creates this system to get good evidence being created, um, to get that information pulled together, to get it linked to practice, the whole, the whole kind of thing, really. Um, and I'm going to use this as the foundation for what I'm going to talk about, about today. So, what is evidence-informed practice? How do we generate useful evidence? Um, what can be done to make this information more accessible? And then how do we support, how do we build capacity so people can be able to make use of, of this research information? And the idea with this is to try and, it all gets rather abstract, doesn't it, in, sometimes? And it was trying to make some of these rather abstract concepts, uh, concepts a little bit more tangible. So there's lots of real world examples not just of an education, but looking at other fields of, uh, to try and illustrate what, um, uh, what we mean by all of this. You can download this from uh, that, that web address there. Um, we're very fortunate in York that the chair of our strategy group is um, Estelle Morris, um, former Secretary of State. Um, seems a long stand, huge long-standing commitment to, to education. And she, she chairs um, the group up at, up at York. And when I first started at York, I heard her talking about what she felt this was all about. And she says, you know when you've been around in education where you see the same idea not appear once, not twice, not three times, you know, but, but starting to appear again and again. And she was um, referring to these classic pendulum swings in education that seems to happen, where new ideas emerge, they're enthusiastically embraced, 
for one reason they found wanting or they disappear out of favour and then they go back out again, only to then re-emerge back in, you know, in cycles. And I think she was referring to topic-based curriculum in primary, which is one of these classic political footballs that seems to come in and out and in and out depending on governments and on different phases. Going right back into the 70s, she was saying, and it's, it's frustrating enough that that happens, but she said what's even more frustrating is that we don't seem to stand on the shoulders of the previous progress we made when we looked at that. So there doesn't seem to be this system in place, really, in education, where we can capture um, really what we, the learning that's, that's made out of all this, this, um, this work that's done. And healthcare and engineering, they're certainly not perfect, these, these fields, but they've certainly developed more coherent systems by, w by which they're able to do that and keep building and developing professional standards by building on research, by building on the, the knowledge held in practice. Um, but I think a big part of that is still research and education. I, th I still think it's seen as something that's still done to the profession rather than with them, rather than for them or by them. And our real belief at York is that it should be the other way around, that research should be serving practice, essentially. And, and the needs of practice, what, what, what do you need to know about what works and how, how things work so that you can use that to develop practice? So our tagline is empowering educators with evidence, and we really believe about turning this, um, turn this on its head. Um, Another one of the things that Stel's rightly pointed out is that for all the areas of reform that goes on in education, until very, very recently, one of the bits that's really been ignored has been this relationship between research and, and practice. All the efforts on curriculum, on school systems, it, it really hasn't been a real focused area of educational reform. And in this report, in, that, um, in the Nest report, borrowed from people like Jonathan Shepherd in criminology and, and people in healthcare, arguing that this will only work when you've got this coherent ecosystem, this evidence ecosystem. Um, and by that, what, what we mean is that you need to have relevant, high-quality evidence that's driven by the cues, by, it's driven by practice, that involves practice in creating that. Um, that information needs pulling together, um, comparing bits of um, individual research with other bits of individual research in terms of a synthesis approach. Um, that information then needs transforming and translating and make it accessible and converting into more useful guidance materials that, that come out of research. And then you need systems in place, whether you call it implementation, but to support the use of that information, to so support the integration of that knowledge into professional practice through training, through professional standards, through, through things like that. And again, you know, medicine isn't perfect, but, but there's certainly developed a more coherent system by, that, by, by which that's able to happen. So you get bodies like NICE that do synthesis and produce guidance that come out of that, that synthesis. You've got the professional bodies that are able to take that information and integrate that into um, professional practice through training and things like that. So that's the um, idea that we've been trying to push. And there's no point doing this. You know, there's no point producing great research if there isn't this... Um, working to be able to do something with that. There is, well, I don't know, we feel as though there's been more going on in this area over the last few years than previously. Um, so, for example, you, know, you might have seen that Cabinet Office did a paper on the use of randomised trials in, in uh, public policy. Um, you've got Ben, ben Goldacre's report they did last year on evidence-informed, evidence-based teaching and what that could look like. It's not just um, government, we've seen this in a cross-party kind of way. Um, Labour have been doing this review on what, a, what, what they're calling an office for educational improvement. So an equivalent to a kind of nice type body in education could look like and what role could that play. So it's good that it's not just, it seems a relatively apolitical issue at the moment. Um, and then you've got practical things like the new cabinet office, what work centres. Um, and then within that, the Education Endowment Foundation, which is one of these new Cabinet Office What Work Centre. So there's a lot more going on in this area at a political level than we think that's ever, ever been going on before. But it seems as though um, it's this side where there's been, where there's more progress. So um, it feels as though the need for good, appropriate, practice-led, high-quality evidence is, is being increasingly recognised and there seems to be a consensus emerging around that. Where, and, and, and to a certain extent, 
an improvement in the way in which that information is synthesised, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Where I think the weak link is still at present is this coupling, this coupling into practice and the coupling um, um, from practice to inform that research. It's this, that seems to me where the gap is at the moment, and I think that's where the efforts need to be put to ensure that this information that's coming out of this synthesis, out of all this research, is really uh, available and, and being used. And this, this, there's so many different words around this, but I think the, the flavour of the month seems to be knowledge mobilisation. <laughs> seems to be, it might change, it'll probably be knowledge transfer. It, it, knowledge transfer, research use, um, I think they all seem to mean, mean a, a similar thing to me. But the, 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 the term that people seem to be settling on at the moment is knowledge mobilisation. So that's what I was going to talk about um, for the rest of the talk. And I was going to try and talk about it by talking some real evidence rather than just principle. Talk about some real evidence and hopefully give some practical opportunities that you can get involved in, things that have been developed that you might be able to use to help you find and, and use research in your, your own context. We've done... I can't remember how many events we've done with asking people what, what the challenges are of using research evidence. We've, been, we've done events, we've done research projects. Pretty, pretty much the same things come up again and again and again. When we ask people, uh, what are the challenges of, of finding, accessing and using evidence to inform what you're doing in your, in your school, this is always the first. <laughs> time, time. There's just too much going on, there's a lot going on, generally to, to try and, and make use now. I think we've heard some really good examples of where you can create that time to do that, but we hear a lot that that, that is a pressure um, to integrate this stuff into your, into your schools. I think it absolutely is, is doable. Um, there's a lot out there. There's, too much, there's a lot of information available. Do you know, how do you make head or tail of all this stuff that's um, out there, knowing where to look for useful information? Not necessarily skilled. You know, jobs as a professional is to, is to be teaching. If you haven't been through training around methodology. It's sometimes quite hard to change the validity of claims of different bits of research, um, sifting reliable conclusions from the rest, and then obviously integrated that into the busy life of a school and to fitting that with all the other pressures that are going on. And these, these messages seem to come up quite, quite consistently. So there are, there, are, there are barriers, there are challenges there. So to give you an example, um, this was a, a review, a, syst a, syst a mixed method, syst systematic review that we did for the Department for Education, uh, it was actually for the Centre for Excellence and Outcomes. What a terrible title we were given. <laughs> Effective classroom strategies for closing the gap in educational achieve achievement for children and young people from poor backgrounds, including white working class boys. <laughs> Lovely, isn't it? And, uh, has anyone, I'm really interested, has anyone heard of this or read it? So, has someone? Way brilliant. <laughs> I think you might be the only one. <laughs> I, don't, I'm, I don't think anyone, I don't thought anyone's read, read this in full, including myself, and I wrote the bloody thing. <laughs> and, uh, and it's, you know, this is a 150 page, dense, it's okay in bits, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty dull, you know. There's, there's some good bits, hopefully, there's some okay bits, but, but it's, it's a research paper. And you go to the back, and there's pages and pages of appendices on how we search for different terms and stuff like that. And yet, I think there's some, there's, there is some hopefully useful stuff. We looked at thousands of studies, looked internationally. There's, there's hopefully some stuff wrapped up in it here. But m my point is that just creating high-quality, you know, detailed systematic reviews or meta-analysis is necessary, but certainly not sufficient. There's lots of these, you know, gathering dust. There's lots of great work that is not being converted into something that's more accessible and useful for for busy practitioners into meaningful materials for, for schools. And what we tend to feel is that the three types of, of, of information um, fr from speaking to, to schools, you need accessible overviews, you know, what, what is it we're talking about, not just what is it, how does it work, what do we know about the context, and this is this point you, you, you're making, Tom, about mixed methods, you need both. You need the information about impact that comes from more quantitative evaluations, but you need this rich colour that comes from more qualitative work about how is it working, in what context, uh, what's going on. So you need both those bits of information. What are the proven outcomes? What's been shown to work in the past? Um, and you know, people need trustworthy assessments of, of that evidence. But this in particular, I think what we, what we tend to find is that even if you give just that information, it's this practical information that, that 
seems to be often missing in, this, in these types of reviews. How do we get it to work in practice? Information on training, costs, links to other practitioners, links to other schools that have got these things working well or are developing interesting things in this area. And that, that seems to be often where the, where the gaps are. Um, so just some examples of things that are available that might be of, um, might be of use. So, where's Jeanette? Okay, Jeanette is in that corner over there. Um, manning a desk on the, on, the, on the top floor. Colleagues at York create two resources that I um, would imagine w w would be of interest. One is a magazine called Better Magazine, which comes out three times a year, um, and it's two-page articles written by world research experts on themes. So there's, there's one on classroom management, there's one out recently on assessment, English, social and emotional learning. We've got a whole range of different, different topics. And they're short, accessible articles with practical summaries at the end, written by, written by experts. And it's just a really, really good way of wetting appetite. These don't make it, you know, won't change the world by themselves, but we find that schools find these interested in just sort of you know, developing new ideas, or that might be something we want to explore. Um, and it's, they're, they're, they're really useful in, in that sense. Um, Jonathan Haslam, who's also upstairs, produces this fantastic fortnightly research digest called Best Evidence in Brief. Um, again, latest research, stuff that's coming out in very, very short paragraphs, basically. So a few hundred, a couple hundred words, what's the, the latest research saying, what are the outcomes. Tends to focus on reviews, so these larger studies that look at um, lots of studies together. Um, and this is free, so just drop them an email at ie at york.ac.uk. And uh, is this still free for the first year, Jeanette? Better magazine? If, if you go back to the hall where you first registered, you can sign up to get a free sample copy. And that's how you do it. You should be able to get it today. And then it's, I mean, it's, it's basically the, the cost of it just to cover printing costs after that. So it's pretty, it works out very, very cheap. Um, so two very immediate, high quality, we think, <laughs> um, you know, uh, resources that are available on that. Um, I'm sure if I asked that question about how many people have heard of the toolkit, I'd say most people have, have heard of this um, teaching and learning toolkit that the Education Endowment Foundation have, have created. And I, I think this has probably been the most significant single piece of work, really, really, of, that, that's come out of education research that's really had the most influence and the most kind of coverage. Um, and I think for a number of reasons. Firstly, it, it, it does look at, at what works, but it also looks at what works best, so it's comparative. So it, it compares things against other, other approaches, and I think that's, that's really significant. And it also looks at, at cost as well. So it looks at you know, the, co the relative cost of doing some of these things as well, and I think that gives much more useful comparative information between different um, strategies. But I think probably the most important thing about it is that it's just very accessible. I don't, you know, if you look on this, it's in that kind of classic witch style format where things are displayed in stars and, and symbols and, and you can basically get at a glance a very, very quick overview of, of, um, of what the evidence um, is saying. It's based on um, meta-analyses, um, which is basically just looking at lots of studies together and pooling, uh, pooling the findings done by um, Steve Higgins and Rob Coe up at Durham University. Um, and if you haven't seen it, you know, really interesting to see what you think and, and, and take a look. Here's this probably a bit small to, um, to see, but this is the information on, I think it's a slightly older version, but this is information on the Pupil Premium Toolkit plotted on an axis of impact and, and, and cost. And it's been quite controversial, some of the, some of the information that's come out of this meta-analysis. Um, Class size is always a big, a big issue here. It turns out you can get moderate, on average, you get moderate effects from reducing class size, but it's very expensive. So, you know, to, to, to reduce class size by a significant level, the, the extra amount of staff turns out to be very expensive. This has probably perhaps been the most controversial about teaching assistants, about the relatively cost um, um, ineffectiveness of, of teaching assistants, but I'm going to come on to that in a minute. Things like one-to-one -one tutoring, which work, but are expensive. But this stuff up in here, this is the kind of the, the relatively high impact for low cost. I think if you look at all of them, they're all kind of got, a, they've got a theme running through them. 
Um, effective feedback, developing self-awareness, metacognition, so that's an awareness of your own um, learning. Peer-to-peer -peer tutoring, so the collaborative, tu uh, um, um, collaborative learning approaches. Homework. They're all aspects of developing resilient, self-motivated, aware, independent learners. And I think that's, th this, is the this is why I think the toolkit's useful, because you start seeing these themes come out of it when you start looking across it. Um, th this is a, a comparison between um, comparison between the findings of the Pupil Premium Toolkit and that systematic review that I, I mentioned um, just before. Funny enough, we did these at a very similar time, actually. And it was only at the end that we sat down and compared. Luckily, they, <laughs> thankfully, they said something similar. Um, it would be a problem if they said something completely different. I mean, there were some differences, but, but overall, there were very, very um, quite similar messages that were coming through from the toolkit and from our, from our review that we did. Firstly, it's the quality of the teaching that, that matters the most. So if you go back to that slide there, all those approaches were about developing. They're all rele relating to high-quality um, teaching methods. Um, so in this context, saying um, just, just adopting a phonics approach by itself is not enough. Um, when we evaluate phonics, different types of phonics programs, we see real variation in the effectiveness of different uh, programs that we should call themselves a phonics program. Generally, phonics programs do work reasonably well, but what seems to be really important is the way in which that phonics reaches the child. It's the pedagogy. It's the, it's the, it's the interaction between the teacher and the child that seems to be, or the child and the child, actually, um, that the pedagogy, the way in which that the um, curriculum is delivered, that seems to be really, really important. And just like in, as in the toolkit, the same things start to emerge as being um, effect, particularly effective. So developing of cooperative learning, thinking and learning skills approaches, use of feedback, formative assessment, things like that. So you can start seeing some, some trends um, coming, coming through. Just, this is slightly, sometimes a bit counterintuitive, just changing the curriculum um, or adopting a different mode of delivery, say, just, say if you teach the same thing but just do it through, through ICT, when we, when we evaluate those types of things, when we look at it, it seems to be much less effective. Now, of, of course, curriculum matters. It matters that people believe what they're doing. Um, and curriculum can, I think, have a significant influence. But it seems to me as though the significant influence comes is when you change the curriculum to unlock really different pedagogy. I don't know, it'd be interesting to see what you think on that, but it seems to me as though that's, what, that's where a curriculum seems to have the most impact, is when it enables you to do something really different and, in, and, and, and high quality in terms of, of, of pedagogy. Um, applying new strategies is difficult. It seems as though, thankfully, you know, the, the day of sending someone on an inset day or sending them on a single day of training and expecting them to come back in the, into the school and... I think, I think we seem to be moving on from that. There seems to be much more work being done in schools, which as you were describing, staff-led professional development with external help coming into that. It seems to be that's where, um, that's where things are heading, thankfully. Um, and this is something that, that Steve Higgins, the author of the toolkit, sort of, I've heard him talk about, is that the devil is in the detail in terms of these things. How the evidence is implied is as important as what um, the evidence says. Um, and the example that I give on, um, in this report on that is talking about um, healthcare, um, is, is hand washing procedures in US hospitals. Um, we know what effective hand washing looks like. We know, we've known for years what effective hand washing looks like in, in hospitals, um, and yet still it's a major cause of deaths death in hospitals, in the, I don't know, the estimated death is massive, and it's estimated to cost billions of dollars as, as, as well. Um, and faced with this kind of conundrum, um, in 2003 it was, a researcher in Baltimore decided to create a, a checklist, a protocol, um, for surgical teams to uh, adopt these hand washing principles and, 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 and and bring them into their um, um, intensive care, care units. They saw an immediate drop on the infection rates inside the, the hospital, uh, inside, inside that, that group. And then when they rolled that out as a trial across all these hospitals in Michigan, they showed a massive reduction, 66% reduction in infection rates, estimated saving 1,500 deaths in 18 months. And 
what it seems in, in this case, what had happened is that they'd taken the principles around hand washing, which, which we knew about and everyone thought they knew about, and packaged them into something um, that could get that into practice. Um, into, in, into this case, into some kind of practical um, intervention. And I, I agree, you have to be careful drawing comparisons between medicine and, um, and education. Now, there are significant differences. But you see, it's not just on very simple things like um, um, hand washing. Things like um, very complex psychodynamic therapies, in aspects of mental health procedures, where there's a very, very contextualised relationship between the, the, the doctor and the, and the patient, are still looked at in these types of ways. You can still um, bring these into a, into a framework, into a practical framework, that, you, that still gives you plenty of flexibility for that individual kind of context. And I, I, I think, I don't know if you heard Rob, I, don't, I didn't see Rob's talk, but I know there's something that Rob talks about. There is, a, I think, a real shortage of high-quality practical vehicles, interventions, CPD, training, to help get this evidence working in practice um, at, at scale um, w with some degree of, of replic replicability and, and rigour. So on assessment for learning, you can argue, I, I would say is relatively over-evidenced and under-practiced. People agree with that? Or, yeah. <laughs> and, and that... You know, we, th there's been a lot said about assessment for learning. Government have talked a lot about assessment for learning. It's been in procedures. You know, it, it's, it's well, well recognised. But it seems to me as though not school struggle to get it conceptualised in a really clear way that, that they seem to own and they can understand and it's working effectively. I'd, I'd be very interested to, if at the end just to get your thoughts on that. And when schools come to us and say, right, OK, can you point us in the direction of some really high quality, well evaluated training or support on assessment for learning? There's a big no at the moment. You know, there is a big gap. There are, there are a million and one people will train you on assessment for learning. Who, uh, do any of them work? You know, what's the impact of them? There's a real mixed bag out there. So there's a real gap, I think, around pulling together good information on, on CPD and, and making that available to the, to the profession. Um, a nice, um, a nice I mentioned about teaching assistants. It's quite a nice, um, okay, great. It's quite a nice example um, where about about the way in which the evidence is applied is, is important. This has been probably possibly the most controversial finding on this pupil premium toolkit, and they're quite, it's quite um, uh, blunt. It says, uh, where's, where's the evidence? Very low or no impact for high cost based on limited evidence. So the first thing to say, actually, there isn't a huge amount of evidence on on looking at the role of teaching assistants. Second thing to say, this is just looking at the impact of teaching assistants on outcomes, and there are many other um, uh, benefits and roles for teaching assistants rather than just on outcomes. But take it, putting those to one side, when you look at the evidence overall about teaching assistants, it doesn't appear as though they have a significant impact on, on, on outcomes. Can I ask a question about yeah, that? yeah, yeah. Is it about the impact of the teaching assistant on the child that they're attached to, or is it the impact of them on the kind of class as a whole? It's, it's when they've looked at studies where, where teaching assistants have been present and not present and looked overall at the impact. Yeah, 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 yeah. And as I say, there's not a, there's not, it's a relatively weak evidence base that underpins this. But I think what this says is that this shows that it seems to reflect often the way in which teaching assistants are used at, pra, at, at present and in the past. This, this is a, a finding on that review that I'm, I mentioned. And this is looking at effect sizes um, for lots of different interventions for struggling readers. Um, so these four here are one-to-one -one tutoring approaches. This is interesting. This is small group approaches that adopt more, more small groups. And as you can see, teaching assistants, when they're well-trained, well-supported, used in a targeted way, you can get great outcomes. You know, the, the evidence shows, the evaluation shows that you can get great outcomes with, with teaching assistants in this review that we did. And I think that's, you know, that, that, that shows that how the evidence is, is being used, how, the, how the, in this case the resource of teaching assistants really, really matters. And to support them in this more structured way seems to be, um, seems to be a sensible thing to look at. Um, the last, last 10 minutes, I wanted to try and give you some, kind of, some ideas and some possibilities that you might be able to make use of. 
Um, this is taken from the right-hand side kind of column of the, of the Pupil Premium Toolkit, and it's a bit where they're trying to help you act on some of this information. And I don't know, when I, sp when I speak to Hez, one of the, the difficulties I think about the toolkit at the moment, it says, yep, it's good, it maps productive space, it's useful, but it leaves us short <coughs> in terms of how do we act on this, you know, what, what's out there. So that's certainly what we're going to be looking at this year, is trying how to help people use some of this information. But what's, what's out there already? What, what, what's kind of coming up? Well, obviously, I mentioned about looking at some complementary resources, so Better Magazine, Best Evidence in, in Brief, they're more detailed looks often at these, some of these areas, so there might be some useful things, pardon me, in there. Um, but how about contacting some of the people that are involved in doing some of this research? Um, I think one of the themes, I think, that's emerged from looking at this whole field of knowledge mobilisation is a realisation that just the passive dissemination of information, you know, j just, just these by themselves, doesn't seem to make all the, all the difference. Where, where you seem to get the most bang for your buck around mobilising knowledge and making use of it is by supporting interactions around that research. And... Um, a lot of the work we do in York now is essentially around signposting. Signposting schools to researchers, signposting schools to rigorously evaluated approaches, setting up collaborations for research partnerships, and possibly most importantly, signposting schools to other schools who have got evidence working in, in, in seems to be in effective ways on, say, peer tutoring or, or whatever it may be. And I think, you know, so, so I actually... <laughs> Kate's here. <laughs> um, so we're doing some work with Harrogate Grammar School around the use of iPads um, um, in the school. And people like Rose Luckin at the Institute of Education do research on the use of mobile devices in schools. Um, Mark Grundy, Shirelands Academy, do some really good work about the use of, of technology in schools. And it, it seems to me as though that, that um, need-led linking, that networking, seems to be a real opportunity. We're still doing networking by who's just down the road, which obviously has value in terms of your context, but I think it's an opportunity to connect people based on the, the practical things that you're trying to do in your, in your school. So one of the things that um, is, is in the pipeline and hopefully going to come up relatively soon is a signposting service called Evidence for the Frontline, and it will involve some kind of map, whether it's a geographic map or not, of researchers, intermediaries, schools, um, developers, um, and there'll be a service that will underpin this, a brokerage service that will underpin this, where we'll help basically connect people up in relation to the things that they're doing and the things that they're trying to do. Um, it might be a new research opportunity, it might be a conversation about getting an approach to work, and then we're going to try and um, oil this, flu of, this um, flow of communication that seems to be important. Next one. What about getting involved in a, in, a, in a big research project? EF have got, the Education Endowment Foundation have got 56 underway. There's going to be loads more coming. Um, you know, there's some great things going on there. There's a whole really wide range of, um, of projects going on. Um, one thing, if you do get involved, you probably can't, you, there's a chance that you'll be randomised to a control group if you do start getting involved in some of these projects. But they often they're on waiting lists, so sometimes you get them, you know, quite often you get them down the line. Um, and if you're interested in that, drop me a, drop me a line at, um, at the EF and, and give you an idea of what's coming up. Um, as we were saying, there is this kind of shortage of rigorously evaluated um, CPD programmes and interventions. Um, on the um, toolkit at the moment, it's linked to the Good CPD Guide, which is a place to, to start. Um, colleagues in York are creating a database called Evidence for Impact. And this is going to be... Um, you can just about see it here, but it's going to be a database of really um, of interventions that have met very, very high standards of evaluation evidence. So things that have been evaluated with, with trials, multiple trials, and shown to have an impact. Um, but on top of just the evidence, the idea is to link to schools, to the researchers, to the people that are underneath it, rather than just giving you a kind of you know, headline, this, this works. It's trying to give this richer information that seems to be, um, to be important. And then... Finally, um, which relates to, I don't know, people saw John, John Thompson and what Tom was talking about, get involved in trying to do some of these evaluations in your own, own school. Um, a couple of people mentioned this DIY evaluation guide that the Education Endowment Foundation have created 
It's written by Rob Coe and, and Stuart Keim up at Durham with help from people at BEF. And it, it really is good. <laughs> you know, um, John Tomsett came to me saying, I'm fed up of not knowing what work in. Can you help me? There's anything out there on evaluation? And it just literally passed into my pigeon. I was like, I'll have that. <laughs> and, um, and he took it away and he made it out as though I'd given him quite a bit of help on it today, but I really didn't. We had, we had, we really didn't. I, I sat with him for, and Alex for about an hour. They had a good idea of what they wanted to do already. I basically told them they're on the right lines, asked a couple, you know, a couple of questions. I then followed up about, about three weeks later, typical academia, that difference between speed of academia and, and, and schools. And I was like, do we, are we going to have that meeting to frame it up? And he went, do you know what, we're just going to do it. <laughs> and then he rang me last week and said, oh, we finished it. So to, he, he was, he, if he said that I was in part, it really wasn't the case at all. Just a, you know, a little bit of input saying, you're on the right lines, this is the frame, how are you going to do it? And it shows that this can be done. It's, I think it's a really nice example of, of, of what can be done in a way that informs the development strategy of the school, not for the sake of it. You know, it it's really integral to what they're doing at, at, um, at Huntingdon. To, to ask questions that they're really interested in, use the method that gives them the right kind of information. You know, the, the, it's not just about impact, it's about how that oral feedback is, is um, working that he was talking about. And, and give it a go. You know, dr again, drop me a line at EF if you want help in terms of, of framing a question. I think we're talking about building some capacity there to be able to support people in doing this kind of thing. But I think it can be a real missing piece of the jigsaw. If you're going to look at evidence, give it a go, then to try and capture the impact of it by using things like this. I think um, you're starting to get more of that ecosystem in, in place. <sighs> Finally, <laughs> um, we run or coordinate a network called the Coalition for Evidence-Based Education. It's been going since around about 2009 and it's this alliance of research, policy, practice, intermediaries collectively trying to work out what could this evidence using and creating culture look like in education. Um, it's ridiculous that these groups are separate. How can you look at research use if you've not got all the parties talking together on this um, and working out what we need to get there? We're running an event, a series of events this year on knowledge mobilisation in practice. It seems that, to me, is where the, the kind of focus is, is, is drawing in on now. This is where we, what we need to look at. Um, and you know, if you've got ideas for events, if you want to host something, if you want to run something, if you want to come along to something, if you, if you go along to this CB website, you can just sign your name up and, and drop us a line and, 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 and get involved. Yeah. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thanks. <laughs>